Okay. So, uh, hello, uh, welcome to this talk on CTI operational procedures with Jupyter Notebooks and MISP. Um, I'm Koen van Impen, so I had a talk yesterday. Today I'm not going to talk about uh, OSINT, uh, botvrije.eu, but I want to talk about something that I thought about when I was making the MISP tip of the week. So, one of the things that I was struggling with was uh, standard operating procedures or CTI operational procedures. Uh, if we talk about operational procedures, there are often three terms that come into play. Playbooks, standard operating procedures, or workflows. And although these three things have some differences, in general, they try to achieve the same goal. We have some consistent approach, a recipe for an investigation, to be repeatable, predictable, and also to have a set of completeness checks. Now, typical formats to encode these operating procedures or workflows, for example, in Markdown, such as the examples done by Microsoft on their GitHub repository, you can also do that in GitLab or in Wiki. Um, the security playbooks from Oasis. These security playbooks are very nice. They are in JSON format, but there's also a MISP object that you can use, which is very great because you can not only have the threat event, you can attach a playbook also to that threat event. There are other examples, such as from uh, the Hive case templates. This is more for security orchestration, and similar, something similar happened exist also for Palo Alto XOR. Now, there's some very simple examples of CTI operational procedures. One point from a consumer point of view, another one as a producer. So as a consumer, imagine there's an, an IP address that popped up during incident response investigation. What are the steps that you can do? What are the steps that you would give to an analyst to go through? For as a consumer, you look up the matches in OSINT feeds, you look up the matches in your internal MISP uh, instance, you document these matches, you document the expected actions that are in that MISP uh, event. Then you can do some enrichment, for example, look up to which ASN does this IP address belong to, to which passive, which passive DNS records do we have, which recur recursive DNS, reverse DNS do we have. You document all these matches, and this can give you some additional IPs or domains that you want to further investigate. This is a consumer point of view. Now, if we look at this as a producer, imagine a junior analyst has to encode an, an object, has to encode a MISP object into a MISP event. We give them some guidelines like, okay, first look for the attributes, make sure there are no false positives. Uh, you attach these attributes to an object, you attach the object to the MISP event, and then you make the relations to the other uh, MISP objects that already exist in your MISP events. So just as a producer and as a consumer. Now, what typically happens, we have a documentation environment that describes this is the reason why you do something. You have a set of scripts that you need to execute, a command that you need to execute. You copy that command, you copy it in a virtual environment, you execute it, you copy the output, you copy that output in your report. I go to the second step, you go to that workflow again, and this goes on and on. And I know the last line is not readable, that's intentional, because this process goes on and on. At a given moment, you're copying a command that you need to execute, and the output of that command has changed. Suddenly, you need to use a different flag, you need to set it up differently, and then you can choose, well, I'm going to update the documentation and wait with the report completion, or you continue with the report completion, you're going to update the documentation at a later stage. So you know that updating documentation probably does never going to happen. So you always have documentation which is outdated and which every analyst has to go through every time make the same mistake. Now, this was one of the issues that I was struggling with and I was looking for a way to make these operational procedures a little bit more easier to share, to have a uniform format to share this with other people also to have some version tracking, so if there's an update to the procedure, that I can go back to an older version. And not just a list of commands that I need to execute, but also some documentation that helps me describing, this is the command that I do, and this is what I expect as an output. This was when I came up with the Jupyter Notebooks to help me with these operational procedures. Now, these Jupyter Notebooks are going to use PyMISP, and if you're not familiar with PyMISP, PyMISP is a very simple Python library to interact with MISP. It allows you to alter data, add data, and to do some automation and integration. So what maybe some of you don't know is that in the PyMISP repository, there are already a couple of notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, that help you to use PyMISP. So this was already the first thing. If you have never used Jupyter notebooks, they're a very simple interactive environment that allow you to write some code execute this code and observe the, obs the execution of the code. You can see immediately the results. Next to this code, you can also attach some documentation. Documentation can exist in text format, markdown, but can also attach an image to it. 
And this gives us two consumer types. So the human who can read the documentation can read the output of the code that you just executed. And at the same time, you can have that code executed by a computer. And that execution in Jupyter Notebooks is done through a kernel, computational engine, which executes that, that code. And that kernel can exist on, can be executed on almost any system, typically a Linux environment. You can attach documentation to it. The documentation is stay, saved on the same location as where you execute that code. So that's where the kernel is running. But the editing of the code of the documentation can be done from anywhere. Now, Jupyter Notebooks are open source, heavily used in data science, but also find their way in other areas. A great feature is that the notebooks are stored in JSON format. I was looking for a format that's easily readable, that has some version tracking, JSON text format, so that already checks one of the, the requirements that I needed. Uh, the computational engine, I'm going to be using Python, but there are other engines that you can use, C++ and Ruby. Um, so combining these two, Jupyter Notebooks and PyMisp already helps me with a lot of, I want to write some very simple, not complex, but very simple operational procedures. So this match is already great. Just one warning, if you use these Jupyter Notebooks, typically for my purpose it was to use it with MISP, running these Jupyter Notebooks from your MISP server, nah, maybe not a good idea, but it's basically giving remote code execution on your MISP server. So that's not the best idea. So the best solution, this is one of the first lessons, you execute these Jupyter Notebooks in an environment that you properly manage, that you set up, and that you backup and configure and secure. And you give that managed environment access to your MISP server through the API key, for example, an URL. So how to get started with Jupyter Notebooks and PyMISP for, for these operational procedures? Very easy, set up a Python virtual environment. You install Jupyter Notebook, you install PyMISP, create an API key for, for MISP, for your MISP in, an instance, and you just start up the notebook. And this starting up the notebooks gives you a web interface. Now, accessing, accessing that web interface typically a notebook is started on localhost, so it will not be accessible from the network. An easy way to do that is you log into your machine and do port forwarding through FI port forwarding, then you can access that notebook. Another way of starting it, and that's the example that I give here, you provide an IP address. When you start up the notebook, it will do the local resolving of that host name. So if you do not give it an IP address but the host name, it will do the local resolving, and it's just going to listen on that IP address. And then you can access that notebook from anywhere through a normal web browser. <coughs> um, when you start up the notebook, so on the console, it gives a token, and that token you need to include in your URL. If you forget that token, it's no problem, you just access the notebook without, uh, so without a token, and you get a form where you can provide that token as input, and token gets set as a local cookie in your browser environment. Now, second lesson, the, the notebooks, they are served from the location where they are started. It means that if you start a notebook from the temp directory, only those notebooks that are stored in a tem directory are directly accessible. It also takes into account the libraries that the, the environment from which you start it. If you start a notebook from a Python virtual library, all the libraries that are installed in that virtual library are accessible in that notebook. If you start it outside that virtual library, these libraries are not um, Python libraries are not accessible. Um, the notebooks are also only meant for single use only. If you access these notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks, with multiple users, your results are going to be cluttered. If you want to have multiple use access, you have to look at uh, Jupyter Hub, which allows multi-user uh, access. Now, once you start up that web interface, so you started it from the console with the IP address provided, and you access it through a web interface, you get a very simple interface at the top file name that you can easily change, double click and you can change the name. Then you have a couple of buttons where you can add additional codes, additional blocks. A block can either be a code block or a documentation block. Um, and then you have a couple of um, buttons to control the execution of the code. You can restart it, you can stop it. Now, for my purpose, for creating these operational procedures, I always start with a skeleton script. A skeleton script that instantiates the libraries that I need to access the, the, the MISP environment, and that also starts a PyMISP object. Now, a second, a third lesson is, if, you if you're familiar with PyMISP, you need to provide it two things, which is the MISP URL and the API key. A good warning is, do not store these credentials in your notebooks. If you want to share that notebook with, notebook with colleagues or with other people, 
It's not a good practice to include, include these credentials, these, these API keys, in your notebooks. So just store it in a different file and access that file from your uh, from the skeleton script. Another lesson is, before you start the operating procedure, do some communication check. Make sure that you're able to access your MISP server. So in this example, I print out the server that I'm going to use for the operational procedure. Before I can print out this debug message, I'm going to use this server. The Py PyMISP object is instantiated. If there's a connection error, the URL is wrong or the API key is not correct, that PyMISP object is not going to be instantiated. And then I'm going to get, get an error. So by just printing out, I'm going to use this server, I know that, okay, the connection is okay, and I can continue with the procedure. So one of the examples is creating a MISP event. Um, Another lesson, so I had a couple of lessons in this slide. Another lesson is to split the actual code execution from the variables. So if you create an, an event, a MISP event through PyMISP, there's a MISP event object that's being created. To make it easier, to make the code a little bit more cleaner, split out these variables from the actual manipulation of the PyMISP object. So afterwards, if you share this procedure, if you share these steps, Someone who access this procedure just have to change the, the block with the variables, and they don't have to fiddle with the actual code. And then for every step that you execute in an operational procedure, every important step that you execute and that interacts, in this case with MISP, print out the results. This gives you a progress, I'm still on track, connection is okay, and there are no intermediate errors. And not only the Python errors that you print out, because that's, that's useful, but also the actual result of the execution of your procedure. And then uh, lastly, as a last step, when you execute, if you when you have executed the operational procedure, print out some kind of a summary. This summary can be useful for reporting, can be useful for other purposes, but print out a summary that gives to an analyst, okay, everything went fine and I got a good, good result from executing this uh, procedure. Um, this is another example for creating an operational procedure for creating a MISP object. So one of the, the examples that I gave as a producer, again here, splitting out the variables, variable section from the actual code manipulation. The third example is um, using, um, sorry, <laughs> by using other libraries apart from the, the PyMISP libraries. So PyMISP libraries, they are already included by the skeleton script, but you're not limited to only these libraries. In this case, I use, for example, the request library to do something which is not immediately accessible through PyMISP. So looking up IP addresses in the, uh, in the feeds cache is not accessible through PyMISP, but you can access the regular MISP API key, API environment. Another example for creating Jupyter Notebooks is if you want to build an integration with a third party. So for example, third party provides you data and you have to integrate that within MISP. Instead of creating all different Python scripts and having different versions and then having documentation in other, in other environments, by just using one Jupyter Notebook, you can demonstrate to your colleagues like this is the way to interact with an API from a third party provider. This is the results that I get. These are the result sets in this format. And these are the manipulations that I need to do to get it into to, to MISP. You immediately have the execution, the sum codes. You also have the documentation that you can later use. It also helps you later on if you have to put it in production. You have an, an example of all the steps that you went through to interact with that API from third party. Um, on the MISP tip of the week repository, I just include a couple of Jupyter notebooks that you can use to get started. Just some examples that are very simple, but that maybe can help you already get started with Jupyter notebooks. Um, when you use these notebooks, one piece of warning is resource monitoring. So in my case, I'm using Python. So these, these are Python processes that are get started. I always open a second console just to monitor, okay, what's CPU usage? Because if the code is not running properly, you can kill the machine. Um, also, if your Python process, the, the return value that it returns, if it's a large set of text, it can slow down your notebooks. So if you're in the possibility to limit the output that your process returns to your notebook as a result of the code execution, that can be a time saver because otherwise all that output is going to be entered in your notebook and can be uh, can slow down your system also. Um, an example for the one the example that I gave for interacting with third party provider, their API environment. <coughs> if you want to use multiple 
variants of code. So instead of having multiple Python scripts, instead of using multiple notebooks, you can have in one notebook different versions of the code that you want to execute. You create one version of the code, you execute it, and then you want to show the second version of the code. So instead of starting a new notebook, you can just change the the behavior of that code block, changing it from code block to a comment. You can still keep it in the notebook. I have one set of documentation that you can use for later on. Just one simple command, one shortcut that you need to use, escape R, which changes a code block from a code execution to just a text block. It's still there and you can still show it to, uh, to your colleagues. And talking about these shortcuts, one of the shortcuts that's not included by default in notebooks is clearing all, all the output. So if you execute a notebook, if you go through all the code executions, the results of these code executions are stored within your notebook. This is something that can be, something that maybe is not desirable, because if you run a notebook, the code output, if you want to share that with your colleagues to show for a report, that's great. If you create a procedure and go, to, for, as, as a help to go through all the different steps, the output of this code, but that's not something, not something that you want to include in your notebook. Something to be aware of. So one of the shortcuts that I advise you to add is, for example, clear all the code output or the code blocks. Before you save the notebook, clear all the code output blocks and you have a clean uh, notebook. The typical workflow that I use for operational procedures is all the notebooks, they are stored in GitLab repository. I have a small script that pulls the latest version, creates a directory with all the new notebooks, and then I store the notebook server from that new directory. I always create a copy of an existing notebook. So instead of using a notebook and working in the already existing notebook, I just create a copy of a notebook and I prepend the case, the case name before that notebook. So I can always go back to the older version. Um, so for me, it was a little bit of an experiment. Does Jupyter Notebooks work well for simple operational procedures? I was very happy with the result because it gives me an opportunity to have code. And instead of having all that code somewhere else and then having to copy paste all these commands and copy, uh, copy pasting back the output into a report, now by having the Jupyter Notebooks, it helps me save a little bit of time and having one version of documentation and code. There's still some progress, uh, some room for improvement. Um, one of the ways would be, for example, for new teams that start with CTI, that start with encoding data, for example, in MISP, while well, it's complaining about quality of the data that gets into MISP, maybe providing them a set of documentation, like if you want to encode specific objects, specific data in MISP, this is a procedure to go to. You give them the notebook, the Jupyter notebook with a Python code, and they can execute it, and they immediately get some guidelines. This is the reason why you do something, and this is the output, and this is immediately the result in uh, MISP. Another Future extension maybe might be collaboration with MISP workflows. MISP workflows currently is in the MISP interface and you see the typical elements to build a workflow, but you cannot document why you need to do something. The fact that these MISP workflows are also in JSON, there might be an integration for the future that you start the workflow from the Jupyter notebook, you start the action, you process the action from the workflow and you integrate that output from the action into your notebook where you have the documentation for why you do specific workflow, and you can also immediately execute it. It's something I, I just discovered for the workflows for yesterday. I'm looking forward for the workshop at the first conference to see how this works, but that might be one of the, the ideas to, to further integrate. And this is basically the, all that I had to tell about Jupyter Notebooks and PyMISP. Great stuff. Any comments or questions, idea? Complain. <laughs> <laughs> I had too much coffee, so if I talk too, too fast, next time I drink less coffee. I have a question. Um, how do you store your variations of Jupyter notebooks in Git? Do you store it with a result each time or never with a result or, or do you separate that? Um, it depends. If I want to make it for a report, so if I want to look at I, for an investigation, I store it with the results. If I want to have it for a reproducible, so for something else, or for, or for example, for a colleague, I store it without the results. So I have a couple of GitHub, uh, GitLab repositories where I store different versions. 
But reporting, then I need to have the, the results, because if you do the, the query, for example, one month later, the results can change. Okay, makes sense. Um, uh, we are thinking of extending maybe even report and stuff like that. Um, do you think that a Jupyter notebook would be an advantage within MISP, or it's better to have it completely outside? Uh, difficult to tell. I think it's a, if you have one interface, it's much more easier for a user. Because now you have to have two interfaces, so if everything is in MISP, maybe that might make more sense. I'm like maybe you're reinventing them. Te the technically, build. it's just the interface pointing to that, so we don't need to change the backend or nothing. It's just like uh, for the user, it's just the interface. Yeah. Nothing else. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Any other questions or feedback? <laughs>